Now, both of you are looking great. Glad to see that uh, you're doing well, and, and it's great to have you here this morning. Well, this morning we come to uh, the latter part of the fifth chapter in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and uh, we've been talking about what it means to live a Christian life, and Paul's been laid has laid a great foundation theologically, and now he's getting into the practical stuff. And today we're going to get into the real practical stuff, and that is living our faith at home and what it means uh, for us to be Christians there in those very close relationships. I want to begin with verse 21 of chapter 5, and I'll read through verse 9 of chapter 6. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is head of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washing, excuse me, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love to himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on this earth. I can't help but chuckle when I read that part. <clears throat> Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Trust, excuse me, try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven. And he has no favorites. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks to God. I want to go back to verse 21. Lindsay, if you would pull that back up, please. Verse 21, structurally in the letter, is, is a transition sentence. It actually kind of wraps up the 20 verses ahead of it. Because in those verses... Paul mentions several characteristics of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. People who live their lives wisely. And he wraps that up by saying that people who are filled with the Spirit of God and who live their lives, their lives wisely are also people who submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I say it's a transition sentence and not an ending because I didn't include it last week. But it's a transition because it does sum up what is above it, but it introduces what comes after it. For without verse 21, verses 22 and following can be misinterpreted. And unfortunately, they have been misinterpreted. So let's take a look at what we can learn about what Paul is saying about submission. First of all, let me say this. The word that Paul uses for submission here um, is a word that means it's something that is active and ongoing. It, it doesn't mean it's passive. Uh, for example, if, if it was a passive suggestion, it would be saying that we are to be submissive. 
Rather than saying that we are to be, it says we are to be submitting, is the whole idea. If it's passive, it means that we have no choice in being submissive. We're commanded to be submissive. But instead, it's voluntary. And, you have, and we have to understand that because not only in verse 21, but throughout the remainder of the, chapter, or the verses that I've read, every time Paul uses the word submissive, that's the idea that he has in mind. Is it's voluntary, and it's something that the individual, the subject, does, but it is not something that is demanded or required of them. You see the difference? Um, and so that's what's very important, so we have to keep that in mind. And so then Paul comes into verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. A passage of scripture that men usually enjoy and women usually do not. Well, I hope today that you'll have a better understanding of these passages and hopefully a greater appreciation for them. What Paul is not saying to the women, to the wives, he is not saying to them or the husbands that they are duty bound to be submissive in a very passive way. No, he's saying out of respect and reverence for Christ, wives submit to your husbands. He's saying to them to set aside what it is that you always want and recognize your husband who is head, as just as Christ is head of the church. Now here's a problem we run into in our culture and our society today. We, miss, we tend to equate Words like submit and words like equality, we tend to equate them, or not necessarily equate them, but we don't see how they relate together. Submission is not authority. There's a difference. But authority is important. For example, all of us as, United, as citizens of the United States, um, we voluntarily submit ourselves to the service of our nation in whatever ways we do that as citizens. However, within our structure, there are lines of authority that we are supposed to respect and honor and recognize. Lines of authority from, from po political lines, from president on down, lines of authority with military, lines of authority with our uh, police force, we are to recognize those lines of authority. They're there to structure and order our society. Most importantly, they're there to protect our society. And what we tend to do in our culture today, or at least what many people are doing, is they're, they're confusing what it means to, to voluntarily submit and what it means to, have, to be under authority. Now, what Paul is saying here is that wives are under the authority of their husbands. What he's not saying here, though, is husbands, you are to abuse that authority. In fact, he's, going to, he's got a lot more to say to husbands in just a few minutes. Paul is recognizing that um, what he is saying, first of all, is also very countercultural in his day. It's very countercultural. Because in his society at that time, uh, the husband, the men, were absolute authority in the homes. And, and when we get into talking about what the husband's responsibility is in a moment, we'll see how that's very revolutionary for what Paul is saying. So what Paul is not saying here is that women are to be submissive in a way that demeans or undermines who they are as persons. What he's saying is, is out of their love and respect for Christ, they also submit to the authority of their husband. Now that's not always easy. Because ladies, let's be honest, sometimes we husbands are wrong, aren't we? I see a lot of head shaking. Sometimes, well, you know, we're not perfect. And sometimes we're wrong. And, but you know what's the best way for us to learn when we're wrong? It's to make the mistake and learn from it. Hopefully. And it doesn't help, though, when you say, I told you not to do that. <laughs> that doesn't help us learn. 
If anything, that helps us to just do it worse again. No, but what we can do, and, and, and guys, what's important for us, because we we got to look at the bigger context. This is just one part of Scripture that deals with relationships, deals with Christian character. While, while we may be the, the ahead of our family, and while the husband may be the, the top authority in our family, it doesn't mean that we don't listen. It, does, it doesn't mean we don't listen to what our wives have to say. Because many times there's, there's great wisdom in what they have to say. Notice though also in this passage, nowhere does it say that husbands are to be submissive to their wives. But what, the, but what he does say to the husbands in just a few moments balances all of that out. Okay? So submission, first of all, has to do with submitting our will, submitting our desire to Christ and then to serve others around us. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the husbands. First of all, Paul, in, in, the, in the Greek, only spends 41 words on the women, on the wives. He writes 116 to the husbands. Now, you can make of that whatever you want. It may be because we're hard-headed. It may be because we don't listen well. But what I believe and I believe the reason for that is is what Paul is saying to the husbands is so countercultural from a Jewish perspective and a Roman perspective and a Greek perspective that Paul had to say it in a lot of words for it to get across. Husbands, love your wives. Not just love, but as Christ loved church. That's the standard that he gave. And then he goes on to talk about what that love looked like. Now, this was so countercultural because, as I mentioned earlier, in the culture that Paul grew up and lived in, the husband was the top authority. Um, and, and from other writings in Paul's letters, other places where sometimes women feel like that Paul didn't like women, which is totally wrong. It's just a misunderstanding of his writings in some places where he says to women there to be silent in the church. Uh, if you got a question, go home and ask your husband later. Don't talk earlier. He's reflecting a lot of the cultural expectations and norms of how men and women relate in culture, outside, in public. And so here, though, he's talking about in the home. And he's saying, husbands, love your wives. Now, that doesn't mean that husbands in his day and time didn't love their wives. They just didn't, they weren't allowed to show it. And they took their authority so seriously that their authority overruled their love. And what Paul is saying is, is no, you, your authority is based on your love. And it is expressed through your love, not simply because it's authority. Does that make sense? So, so in these verses, Paul is drawing an analogy between a marriage, between men and women, and he's also talking about the church as being the bride of Christ. And so there's, there's a lot of mixing of metaphors as we read through this. So, for example, um, in verse 26, He says, first of all, in verses 25 and 26, back up to 25, Lindsay. He says, the husbands are to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Why? He gives a purpose. The purpose for this love is that Christ gave up his life for her, referring to the church. Why? To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Now, the literal wording there in that last part is... Washed with water in the Word. Now, there's been a lot of misunderstanding here because we Christians want to tend to take any time we hear the word water and washing, we want to make it assume that it's baptism. And any time we hear word, we want to say it's God's Word. Well, that's not the case here. The words that Paul uses here have nothing to do with spiritual ritual. It has to do with the with the marriage ritual. You see, in, in Paul's time, if a Jewish man 
wanted to propose to a young woman to be his wife, he would go to her and bring her a gift and say to her, you are now my, you are now betrothed to me. You are my wife to be. You are mine. That was the word spoken. And then roughly a year later, just before their wedding, the wife would take what was referred to as a bridal bath just before the wedding service. It was a, it was a, it was a bath, but yet it was ritually to prepare her for her husband. And so when he says here that she is made clean by water, you see, Paul is actually thinking about this bridal bath and in the word, he's thinking about the word where the man proclaimed the woman to be his engaged fiance. Is the words we would use today. So it's not really talking about baptism in God's word. It's talking about the marriage ritual. But here's the thing I want you to notice that we tend to overlook. Just as Christ is working to make the church holy and pure to be presented to him as his bride. If you read on in the letter of Revelation, you'll see that God presents the church, the bride of Christ, to Christ. That he's preparing the church. What he's saying here is as husbands, in addition to loving our wives, we are to be making our wives pure and holy and preparing them in such a way that they can be presented to Christ as pure and holy. Notice he doesn't say anything at all in this passage about the wife being the nurturer of the relationship. Instead, what he's saying is, as husbands, you are the nurturer in the relationship. Now, that's not only countercultural, that even feels, for most of us, contrary to the way we're put together. Lisa's a lot more naturally nurturing than I am. I have to work hard at it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying as, as husbands, as Christian husbands, it is our responsibility to nurture the love of Christ in our homes, first in our marriage, then with our children, and then in our places of work. It's our responsibility. It's not our responsibility to take advantage of or to abuse our wives and our children in any way. So the, the real emphasis here is on husbands loving their wives and later their children that he talks about. Why? So that they can grow in their relationship with Christ so that God is pleased with them as well. Let me reread verses 27 and 28 for you. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually loves himself. You know, guys, if you want your wife to genuinely be happy, it's up to you to help her be happy. Now, I understand and I realize, and, and I have said it standing right here many times, we, you and I, cannot change another person. And I believe that. I'm convicted. I feel a strong conviction for that. However, we can do everything within the power that we have and everything that God flows through us into the life of another person to help them become the person God wants them to become. And so guys, if you if you if you think it or if you literally say it to your wife and wonder why she's always frowning, wonder why she's always down, maybe wonder why she's not happy. You might be the reason. And even if you're not the reason, it's your responsibility to help her find out why she's that way. 
and help her to become everything she can become. You know, in our in our culture, it's not just in our culture, it's in all cultures. We tend to think of beauty as only on the outside. But we know that real beauty goes all the way in. And that truly beautiful people, men and women, is some, has more to do about their energy that they portray in a room. It has more to do about what their eyes say and what their face says and their body language says. We, we know that. Just as Christ wants to present the church to himself, spotless and without blame, guys, we have a responsibility to help our wives to be as pure and as spotless as they can be. Not so that they're a trophy that hangs on our arm and we can brag about. Okay? That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is so she can be Truly the person God wants her to be. I find it interesting in this, in this passage and in other passages in the New Testament that nothing is said about the wife helping the husband become all he can be. Everything is said about the husband helping the wife become all that she can be before God. The responsibility is ours. You and I, men, are the, supposed to be the nurturers in our family. Now, I will tell you this, our wives know it a lot better than we do, and we can learn from them and listen to them. When Lisa was pregnant with all three of our boys, but especially with Adam, since he was the first one, I've shared with you before how the, uh, my family has struggled with verbally expressing our love for one another. And... From the moment she knew she was pregnant with all three of them, she started talking to herself, talking to the baby. And it took me quite a while because she'd say, don't you need, you know, the babies can hear. We don't know how early, but they can hear. You, you need to talk to this baby. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you want me to talk to your stomach? And I, you know, I, you know, want to please her, so okay, I will. Hi. <laughs> Is it warm in there? It's cold out here. And, you know, just whatever I could. And, and I finally got more comfortable with it. When the boys were born, I got more comfortable with telling them that I loved them. And, and now that the boys are grown and I'm grown and I'm falling back into, you know, they're men, they're young men now. And Lisa reminds me regularly, you need to tell them you love them before you hang up. Have you talked to the boys lately? Referring to Adam and Eric since they live off. She she's coaches me because I need to be coached. But it's still my responsibility and your responsibility to make sure that love is nurtured in your families. Oh, there's a, a whole lot more that could be said about this. I'm not running out of time. Let me just say that regarding <coughs> verses six, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, if you think about what I've said here this morning regarding the word submission and regarding the words love, I think you can understand the rest of it. You know, he tells the children, be obedient to your parents. Why? Things will go well for you and you'll live a long time. <laughs> like I said, I can't help but chuckle every time I read it. But he says, more importantly, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Now, does that mean we should never make them angry? No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is, is don't be unnecessarily harsh. There are times when we have to be harsh. There are times when we have to speak the truth in love. But we do it in love. And there are times when our kids are not going to like us. I get frustrated with parents who think they're their kid's friend and not their parents. They're the parents. And we have to make decisions that our kids aren't going to like. But we do it because we love them. Now, we don't have slaves in our society, and there's more I can say there. A lot of people say, well, why didn't Paul denounce slavery? 
we're not going to get into all of that, but what you and I can think about here is our work relationships. Christian employees and Christian employers should, should honor and respect Christ in their mutual relationships in, in those places as well. You know, that's why I said in my newsletter article, the most difficult place to be a Christian is at home and at work. Because that's where people see you all the time. That's where people see you when you're frustrated. That's where people see you when you get angry. That's where people see you when you're at your worst. And they remember that far longer than they remember when you're at your best. So it's the most difficult place to be a Christian. But it's the most important place. The most important place. I'm sure this has happened to some of you at some point in time on a Sunday morning when you have small children. You get up and things aren't going quite as well as it should because you're getting ready for church. And the kids are playing, but they're not getting ready. And if anything can go wrong, it goes wrong on Sunday morning. And you get in the car and all the way to church, you're yeah, 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 just chewing one another out. Yeah, 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 yeah. As soon as you walk in church, hi, how you doing? Well, we've all done it. We've all been there. Yes, it's important when we're in church or in public that we that we let the love of Christ flow through us and that Christ's light shines through us. But it's most important at home. That's where it has to start. So how's your home? How's your marriage relationship? How's your relationship with your kids, with your parents? How is it at work? How is it with you in those places? Are you submitting and loving out of reverence for Christ? I pray that you are. And I pray that you'll continue to. Father, we're grateful for your love and for your for the wonderful example that Christ gave. Lord, we know that even within within you, within who you are as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that there is mutual love and respect, but we also know that there are lines of authority because the Father, the, the Son submits to the Father, and the Holy Spirit submits to the Father and the Son, and yet, and yet, there is love there. Lord, we pray that that's what will happen with us. We pray that we'll recognize one another as truly your sons and daughters, and that we will love one another greatly, just as Christ loved. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We please stand as Rhonda comes to lead us in our closing song. Hymn number 664, and the words will also be on the screen.